The final base is going to be made up out of three individual boards of wood. I think ideally I would have liked to use a solid piece of wood, but wood is hard to come by here in Italy. Good hardwood and especially larger pieces of wood can be both hard to find and very expensive. Stone is also an option of course, which would have worked fine, and stone is readily available and very cheap here in Italy. Stone is however, unfortunately hard to work with and much less flexible than wood. It's also heavier of course, and much more prone to breaking during transport. So wood it is, and since I can't find a solid piece, I'll use multiple boards and glue them together. This way, I can get a thicker and more substantial base, which will help keep the footprint of the sculpture down, while at the same time giving it enough weight so that it doesn't tip over too easily. A tall sculpture like this, with a lot of the weight at the top, can be a bit difficult to mount well because of its imbalance. It's going to be prone to falling over, so you're going to need a heavy base at the bottom to keep it from falling over. The base that you're seeing me make here was for a different sculpture, but for the same exhibition. So both bases were made in the same way, but I ended up only filming one thinking that since the technique employed is the same, it shouldn't matter too much to you. The difference is that in the base for Kronos, and you're watching me make the base for the king here, or glue up the base for the king, in the base for Kronos I used three smaller pieces of wood stacked on top of each other instead of two, but I did glue one at a time, so the process is the same, just repeated a second time to get the third piece of wood attached. The process of gluing wood is not complicated and does not require many tools. To make sure that you get an even spread of glue everywhere on the surface that you're gluing, I suggest brushing the glue all over the surface. And of course the brush is going to be toast after this, so use a disposable one. You might get some squeeze out doing this, meaning the glue comes out of the seam between the two pieces once they are clamped together. But this is actually considered a good thing, as it means there is glue everywhere in the joint between your two pieces of wood. Squeeze out can be cleaned up easily before the glue sets up using a damp cloth, and it's better to get it, clean it up that is, before it does harden, because after that you're going to have to sand, etc. And it can easily be cleaned up with a damp cloth before it does so, before it sets. You won't need screws or nails if you attach something like this with wood glue. The wood, the glue rather, is plenty strong, the surfaces that are joined together are plenty wide, and there is nothing here that's going to have a lot of force applied to it in a way that would, or could even, break the glue bond. If you have a small glue surface and there is potential for pressure being applied in a way that could break the glue bond, then perhaps some other fastener is required. But here we'll be okay for sure. We're using C-clamps, which can be found in any hardware store pretty much, to hold the two pieces of wood together firmly, and make sure that they don't move or slide apart during the glue up. Clamping them together, like this, also ensures even pressure along the entire surface, which in turn gives us the best chance at a decent bond. I used pieces of scrap wood, 2x4s, to spread the clamping pressure further and also to ensure that the clamps didn't make impact marks in the surface of my wooden base. That would have looked pretty bad, of course, and could have perhaps been even hard to sand out, or to fix. Since the wood I'm using is pretty soft, some sort of fur or something like that, I'm not entirely sure what kind of wood it is, but it's certainly not some fancy hardwood. So because it is a soft wood, the chance of something like that happening seems to be rather great, so making sure that you clamp down on something else other than the wood itself is definitely beneficial. I tried my best before the final clamping pressure was applied to make sure that the two pieces lined up perfectly, because I don't want to have to figure out or sand some sides straight after the glue up, that would have been a nightmare job. 
and I also considered carefully what sides I wanted facing forwards or match each other, since this is going to end up mattering visually. If the two pieces of board, or the edges that are lined up together of the two pieces of board don't match well together in terms of grain texture and color, then it can be easy to see that this is two pieces of wood glued together and not a solid piece. This would sort of make it look a bit cheaper, I think, so picking sides to the board that blend together and make sure they face the same way is a good idea. Now we're getting into the dangerous part of this process. And knowing this, you, you have been warned. I'll do some pretty stupid things here that I'd be very careful about doing if I were you. But either way, let's get to it. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you guys know when I'm doing something that's not so clever. First, we need to find out where to drill a hole in this wooden base to mount the sculpture. This can sometimes be hard to figure out if you have the mounting hardware off-center underneath your sculpture. In this scenario, it's super easy since the mounting hardware on our sculpture comes out of the bottom of it in the middle and we'd like the sculpture to be perfectly centered on the base. If you're not dealing with a similar scenario to this, there I do have a tutorial where I detail how you can mount something where the mounting hardware is not centered. That video is called Casting in Hydro Resin. As I said, here it's pretty simple. We just need to find the center of the wooden base, which is easy enough. You simply draw lines from either corner and those two lines should meet somewhere and that should be the middle if you've done your job correctly. What we'll be trying to do is to drill two differently sized holes at either end of the base, one big one and one smaller one. The smaller hole is going to be where the threaded rod of the sculpture enters into the base. And this hole obviously needs to be barely bigger, or more or less the size, of the threaded rod coming out of the sculpture. Because we want the base flush with the table surface, we need to put the mounting hardware underneath the base, but we need somewhere to put said mounting hardware, and so we're going to drill a bigger hole and put it inside the base. In the temporary base, the mounting hardware is simply sitting underneath the wooden board with no countersunk hole, which, but, but that works because the temporary base had boards lifting the wood off the table surface. That's easier, of course, but it's not really exhibit ready in my opinion. It looks pretty cheap and it looks pretty work in progress. So we're going to drill what's known as a countersink hole in the bottom of the base, and this hole is going to fit all the mounting hardware inside of it and hide it from the viewer. To drill a big hole, we're going to use something called a Forstner bit. These drill bits are great for getting rid of a ton of materials and work well, at least in this scenario, in comparison to a hole saw, which does the same thing, but would require you to drill a hole straight through the base to the other side in order to get the mass of wood we're looking to remove out. The problem being, of course, that Big Forstner bits like this are not really safe to use, or easy to use for that matter, in a handheld drill. It even says on the box to not use them in a handheld drill, but use them in a drill press. I don't have a drill press, yet, and so I'm doing what I can here, and it's a bit chaotic to say the least, so I cut a bunch of it out. Ideally, you will have one hole to drill, but my bit wasn't big enough, and so I needed to drill three holes overlapping each other. And this is definitely another big no-no, since the overlapping holes make it very difficult to keep the bit perfectly vertical, which essentially just means that it wants to slide around and jump around a lot, and even more of course when you don't use a drill press. So if I were you, try to do this the right way using a drill press, and if you don't have one, see if you can get access to one. Try not to do it like I'm doing it here, because it's definitely very far from ideal. I was in a rush here trying to finish this for an exhibition, which is no excuse of course, but some poor decisions were made, and please don't make the same poor decisions that I made. Once the hole is big enough and I can fit the mounting hardware into it, I'm going to stop drilling. I don't want to drill this hole super deep, I just want it deep enough to where the mounting hardware disappears. 
The reason for this is that I'd like my as much of my threaded rod as possible to travel through the narrow hole, which won't allow for any, or will allow for less wiggle room, let's say. And if you only have a short distance where the threaded rod is traveling, a small hole that's really short and then a giant hole on the other side, the sculpture will be more wobbly. So doing it this way will keep the sculpture more stable, hopefully. I drilled the bottom first because I was very nervous about drilling the top surface. The sculpture itself doesn't really cover a lot of the base. It's very narrow at the bottom. So if I make a mess of this drilling of the top surface, I might have a hard time salvaging the surface or the entire base for that matter. Because of the size of the threaded rod, I had to use another Forstner bit to start the hole with. Now, a smaller Forstner bit like this is not too hard to use, so this, and, and since there's no overlapping holes as well, it's just digging straight down. That sort of helps as well, so that made it a little bit easier. This certainly would have been another place where a drill press would have been the ideal way of doing things, however. If I drill this hole at a slight angle, which is very possible when using a handheld drill, then the sculpture is going to be mounted somewhat sideways or with a bit of a tilt to it. Since this is something that I don't want, I need to do my best to make sure that the drill bit enters into the wood base at a near 90 degree or as near to 90 degrees as I can possibly manage. And it does help, frankly, a little bit if the hole that you drill is ever so slightly bigger than the threaded rod, so that there's just a touch of wiggle room. That, And in that way, you can be a few degrees off and it will still work. The Forstner bit wasn't really long enough to go through the entire thickness of the base, even when I cheat and mount it further out in the chuck of my drill, which I really don't think is safe practice either, so don't do that. So to drill through to the other side, I got myself an auger bit, which is made, which is a bit made for drilling into wood. It has this little screw, trip, screw tip at the end of the drill, at the end of the bit, which pulls the drill bit through the wood, leaving you with not having to put so much weight and pressure on what is usually a long and fragile drill bit. Auger bits are meant to drill long holes, so they're very long, and if you had to lean on that very hard to make it go through the wood, it could break. But because of the screw tip, it pulls itself through the wood. 